This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchman video broadcast. We're dealing with the number 13 on the back of the $1 bill, the great seal of the United States of America. And why in the world does it have all of these 13s on there? I mean, I can understand. Okay, 13 colonies, which we've dealt with previously. But why does there have to be 13 arrows? That 13 arrows, 13 leaves and olives on the branch. That was done later than the, the original of the seal. E pluribus unum instead of ex pluribus unum and had a guy knew, that knew Latin that actually said e pluribus unum was a correct way of saying it, but it is a shortened way and they did it on purpose. So I appreciate your correction there. 13 stars on here. Um, Anuit coeptus. 13 letters, Novus Ordo Seclorum, and when you add Novus Ordo Seclorum with the 1776 on the back, on the base of the pyramid, you have 26 letters, which is divisible by 13, 13 times 2. So why all of these 13s on here? Well, let's look in Revelation 13. I had this thought, and I want to start out with this. Revelation 13, because I believe my Bible is in order. I believe God puts everything where he wanted it. That's what I believe. He put all the stars where he wanted them. He put all of us people where he wanted us. And I believe that he put all of his words exactly where he wanted them. Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and his, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The ten horns represent dominion. Think of the ten toes. Ten kings is what the Bible says they represent. So we know and understand from the Bible that there is going to come a time, a particular time, when a, a kingdom is going to arise out of the sea. A kingdom and its king. And I say that because he rises up and um, he has been given, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. That means this beast is going to reign with the power of Lucifer himself. Um, verse 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So no one can fight him. No one can resist him. And uh, think of how this relates. Genesis 13, 13. We, we were talking about that the last time, where it talks about the men of Sodom, being wicked uh, exceedingly before the Lord. Uh, I'm going to read the exact verse here. And we noted that it had exactly 13 words in it. Uh, the, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So think of, in Revelation 13, this man of sin being something that nobody can make war with him. Think about, think about man's sin. The sins that you and I bear in our flesh. We, we fight against them, but we never win, do we? Not without Christ, we don't. So who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? But anyway, the idea, this number 13, we dealt with the idea of Sodom, it representing Mystery Babylon the Great. Uh, Sodom was destroyed, went up in flames. Babylon is going to be done the same way. Uh, but we're dealing with the idea that this number 13 points us to something that's coming, a kingdom that's coming and it's going to be unlike anything else that has ever been on the earth and I want you to keep that in mind as we look at this because we note on the bottom of the uh, unfinished pyramid on the great seal it says novus ordo seclorum novus meaning new order ordo a, a new way of doing things a new order, a new type of, a new system of government, a new paradigm that is unlike anything else that this earth has ever seen in its history. I mean, when you study this beast and you study according to the scriptures, what God gives him the ability to do, he literally is going to rule over everybody on the planet with the exception of those whom he has sealed in the nation of Israel. That's what I see from the scriptures. All of the, There have been rulers. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do it. Nimrod started it. He started a kingdom in Babel. That was the beginning of his kingdom. 
uh, but he was never able to finish it. In other words, he wanted that city and that tower built, and then God scattered everybody. Well, you can't rule over everybody if you can't catch them, if you can't control them. But Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, Adolf Hitler, Napoleon, um, Russia, it, the, the list goes on and on of the number of kingdoms or people throughout history who have attempted to rule the world. Never worked out quite as like they thought it was going to. All of that's going to change. This beast is going to rise up and he's going to institute a new order on the earth where he is going to do what everybody else that came before him failed in. God is going to give him the power to rule over the entire world. And that's what Novus Ordo Seclorum means. A new, um, a lot of the people say new world order or a new order of the ages. The, world, the word world and ages does in the scriptures have sort of a, a similar idea and a similar concept. Peter was talking about in, um, when he was referring to the days before and after the flood, he said in 2 Peter 3, 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now God didn't destroy the entire earth itself, the planet, at that time, what he did was he overthrew the world. He flooded it. He wiped out all of the civilizations, all of the people, uh, all, of their, all of their vast empires. I mean, he wiped it all out. So now, and I think this is so neat, and this is going to tie in to what we're talking about. The days of Noah was a type of an old world and a new world. The number eight in the Bible is always the number for new beginnings, new life. Isaac was to be circumcised on the eighth day. That's a picture of salvation, which is new life. The first day of the week is actually day number eight, because the week has seven days. Seven is the number for completion. The week is over with. And the eighth day is actually the first day of a new week. So you kind of see that there. Even the, even the, the number eight kind of goes like that. It just keeps going on. So in the grand scheme of things, here we have eight people on the ark, and they survive from the old world in Genesis 7 to the new world in Genesis chapter 8. It's a picture of what God's going to do with his people at the end of time when all this stuff is, is destroying the world. God is going to carry his people in Christ. Christ is the ark. He's going to carry his people in Christ from the old world to the new world. That's God's way, and it all has to do with Jesus Christ. There is the opposite of that. A new world, not where people are transitioned from the old world to the new in Christ. They're transitioned from the old to the new in the Antichrist. Remember Charles Taze Russell. Remember what we talked about the last time we were dealing with this. His divine plan for the ages, and here he is showing the pyramid. And if you look on his chart here of dispensations, you'll see that he has a dispensation coming or an age. He calls it the Messianic Age. And notice that throughout the ages on Taze Russell's chart, the pyramid grows taller and taller and taller toward heaven. Then, in the Messianic age, the pyramid is topped with the capstone, which Taze Russell and others say is Jesus. And they're lying. It's not The capstone is not Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone of the foundation. So, it made sense to me. That and it just dawned on me. I was going back over this, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't, I don't. Do you remember what the um, the Jehovah's Witness Bible is called? Because see, they reject the King James, and what they did was they followed after the manuscripts of Old Westcott and Old Hort, who went after the corrupted line of manuscripts that the NIV, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, and all of these other, let's see here, we have uh, the book. All of these newer translations follow the West Cotton Hort paradigm. It's a different Bible. It's a different vine. 
that they came from. Go watch the Watchman video broadcast. It was a series uh, called Which Bible You Be the Judge? And you'll see that there were two lines of manuscripts. So the there, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, they rejected the King James because it had all that pesky stuff in there about Jesus being God. And we can't have that because, you know, we don't believe that. So they do what practically everybody else does when they have a belief and they won't let go of it. And then the Bible, the King James Bible, actually discredits their belief. They go, that's, that's not real. So they rewrite their Bible. And so they have... Because Taze Russell believed in this new time, this new age, this new order, a new world. With the pyramid and the capstone. Their, their Bible's the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. And I'm sure, as a student of prophecy, as, as people who scour the internet looking for... Illuminati conspiracies and things like that. You have heard of the phrase New World Order. George Bush came out with it September 11th, 1990. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a New World Order. There's Time Magazine, him and Gorbachev talking about building a New World Order. Here is soon to be Prime Minister of England, Gordon Brown, talking about we need a new world order to save the earth. The, the very first Watchman broadcast that I did in, in January of 2009, I was just looking for stuff to talk about. And here comes Henry Kissinger coming. Remember, 2009 was when Obama was inaugurated. And, here come, and we had the housing market that had absolutely collapsed in this nation and here's Henry Kissinger coming out on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and he's going what we need here is a new world order. I've heard people say that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist and I'm just going I don't think so. Now nah, he's, he's way too old for the job. Uh, but anyway Kissinger, Brown, the Bushes, the Clintons, the Obamas, it doesn't matter, the Gorbachevses, it doesn't matter who in the world, all of these people, because they follow the spirit of this world, the prince of the power of the air, all of them are progressing the world toward a new world order, a new way of doing things. It will involve a new religion. Let's stop and think about this. How do you, how do you bring a new religion in the world? You've got to destroy everybody's old religion. That's what you have to do. You have to destroy it. You and I have seen the movies. We've seen the TV shows. We've heard the speculation about what would happen if all of a sudden there was uh, uh, some alien life detected out there. And, and, and what, what would that do to all the, all the religions of the world? I was watching um, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey the other day. And uh, that's what they were talking about. They were talking about this monolith that they found on the moon, and they said, "Can we? You know, why don't we tell everybody?" No, we can't, because it's going to it's going to shake the foundations of the earth. It's going to destroy everybody's religion. Think about it. Uh, you're going to need a new currency. What are they doing right now? They're they're destroying the dollar. They're going to destroy all of the other currencies that the world is based upon. You have to destroy that so you can bring in a new currency. They're going to bring in a new political system. And it won't be politics as usual. I promise you it won't be. It won't be, well, the Democrats over here and the Republicans over here, or the, um, what is it in England? You have the Labor Party and you have the whatever parties in there. You have the conservatives and liberals. The idea is to get them to clash. Synthesis and antithesis, or excuse me, thesis and anth antithesis clashing together to produce a new synthetic government. It's the fusion of opposites. And I want you to remember that because that's what this new world order is based upon. But everybody's talking about it. Adolf Hitler. George Bush did not invent the phrase new world order, nor did he, did he invent the concept of having a new order. One of the very few video games that I've ever played in my life I was walked into a computer store, Circuit City, Back in 1992, I think, somewhere around in there. And I'm captivated at this IBM PC clone retailing for like 1500 bucks. And this game that I'd never seen anything like it before, Castle Wolfenstein. You remember that? One of the first 3D games. And I'm standing there in this store with this mouse. And I'm walking through all these. And I'm just going, I got to have that. 
then they have a, had a newer version come out, I think in the 90s. I got that. Now there's a new version of Castle Wolfenstein. It's called The New Order. It speculates, what if Hitler lived? What if he actually won the war? I think that's why. I don't have the game, but I think that's what it's about. Because Hitler was going to institute something that he called his thousand year Reich. Where did he get that from? Thousand year. Did, surely he didn't think he was going to live a thousand years. Where did he get that from? Got it from here. Remember? There is a new time coming. There is a new world, a new heavens and a new earth that is coming. The days of Noah was the prototype of that. It was the typology. It was the picture of what God is going to do. Here we see it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or, it, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years years. That is the kingdom of Jesus Christ on this earth, the kingdom of God, um, and Jesus ruling over all of the peoples and the nations on the earth. Those ten thousands of his saints, uh, what Enoch said according to Jude, coming back with him, I believe that's the, those who have been translated prior to the Lord's second coming in Revelation chapter 19. Here we have the Word of God now coming. The Word of God is what's going to reign upon planet Earth and bring in a... It's the rest. It's the Sabbath day. The swords are going to be beat into plowshares. The um, Denver airport has a mural of that, doesn't it? Uh, the United Nations talks about a time when the swords, when they are going to bring about a new era, when the swords are going to be beat into plowshares. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ can bring peace. And that can only happen when the accuser of the brethren, the devil, is bound for 1,000 years. And so Hitler, knowing probably just enough about the Bible to see himself as this Christ figure who is going to rule and institute a rule a government over the entire earth. Um, you want to be part of my new government? Adolf Hitler says, no. Well, how about this? <laughs> now you are. That was, that was how he did it. It's how the Muslims are trying to do it. But it was interesting to me that Hitler called his thousand-year reign the new order. Here's a quote that he said. The year 1941 will be, I am convinced, the historical year of a great European new order. Hitler was going to take over France. He was going to take over all the European nations. Poland, he was marching through. He was going to take over Great Britain. He hated Great Britain. And then the Japanese just had to go and stir us up, bring us into World War II by bombing uh, Pearl Harbor. And now all of a sudden Hitler's got a deal with what has been called the greatest generation of Americans. That, that generation who went out, most of them volunteered to fight World War II and to keep freedom in Europe and to keep freedom in America and revenge for bombing our naval yard in, in Pearl Harbor. My uncle was a Pacific Island Marine and he told me stories and I can tell you truly that generation was one of the greatest generations of America. And that's what Hitler ran into. Of course, that was a day in America when practically everybody believed or at least had a reverence and a respect for the Word of God. That was, that was the America then. We don't have that America anymore. But that's what Hitler ran into. But his idea was that he was going to institute a new world order on planet Earth. So what is the difference? What is the difference between Adolf Hitler wanting to do it and, and uh, George Bush wanting to do it, or Bill Clinton, or Henry Kissinger. What is the difference? It's the same new order 
that seeks to replace all of the old traditions, all of the old ideas, certainly all of the old religions, including Bible Christianity. So now we have gotten used to this phrase, New World Order. We see it advertising, New World, doing things different. I want to stop right here. I want you to think about this, because that's what it is. It's not just like getting a new president. When you get a new president, you, we don't automatically expect that the whole country is going to turn around overnight good or bad. We don't think that because we know it's a process. But everybody who talks about a new order, a novus ordo, says it's going to be a completely different, fundamentally different way of thinking, living, worshiping. Everything is going to change. So, New World, doing things different. New World Pharmaceuticals, think about that. See that pentagram? See that, See that little man jumping the letter O there in the word world? That's a form of a pentagram is what that is. And it's, it's basically the one rising out of the four. We've talked about that. Uh, a brave new world. Here's this guy with his pair of jeans on running into the ocean. Hmm. Strike up for the new world. Talk about imagery there the beast rising up out of the sea. Here's another, Camel Lights, it's a whole new world. Um, Cadillac, a new world order. They're marketing this. Do you remember? And I will show you the stars. You remember, um, I almost said Little Mermaid, Aladdin with Robin Williams. You remember that? Remember the song in there? One, one of the prettiest songs ever written for a cartoon. I mean, you gotta admit, but remember what it was. A whole new, look at the lyrics, a whole new world. Don't you dare close your eyes. A new fantastic point of view. Think about it. Think about what was being sold and marketed. This little kid's cartoon. One of the biggest selling movies of the time. Every kid was, just like every kid's walking around going, let it go, let it go. I don't get it. They were, they were talking about Aladdin, the New World Order, a, a new point of view. You know how you get that? You open up another eye. And that's what they're talking about. It's, a new, it, it's exactly what the serpent said was going to happen. Then shall your eyes be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the new world has everything to do with opening up man's consciousness so that he sees differently than he ever saw before. And we use the word see as like a, a metaphor for think. Well, I don't see it that way, which means I don't agree with your thoughts. I think completely different. So the new world order or a new order has everything to do with changing everybody's mind and opinion. And it's happening in the church. Here's a church called the New Paradigm Church. See that as above, so below thing with the cross and the circle, and everything's a new paradigm. Rick Warren. Rick Warren started this because he was talking about a paradigm shift. And Rick Warren bragged that he, was, he preaches a paradigm shift, and he was a paradigm-shifting preacher. And he teaches all of his other pastors that follow him, don't say repentance. Don't say you must repent. Tell them, you need to shift your paradigm. You need to have a new way of thinking. And where did Ricky Warren get that from? He got it from Marilyn Ferguson, the Aquarian Conspiracy, who talks in here about paradigms are going to shift. Things are going to change. There's going to be a new way. Here it is right here. Unless, of course, you can harmonize the ideas into a powerful synthesis. That is a paradigm change. Transformation. It is the fourth dimension of change, a new perspective. That's what she says is going to happen. And what we know from the scriptures is, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And when this beast rises up out of the sea, that age and that time is going to change everybody's thinking. They're going to have a new spirit in them. Paul warned us about that, 2 Corinthians 11. If God brings you another Jesus, another spirit whom you have not received, 
or another gospel. You'll bear with him. You'll listen to him. You'll listen to his sermons and his, and his lectures as he brings you into this new paradigm with this new spirit and this new Jesus and this new gospel. And that is exactly what this is all about, and that's what Ferguson was writing about here. You see, all of this stuff, I get it. It's all bogus. It's all phony. They're not telling you the truth. But what they are telling you is their plans but they try to keep it hidden under symbols and metaphors and phrases, whereas this tells you the absolute truth of it. And it tells you what spirit it is of. So, we have um, a new age of Aquarius coming. Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike talks about it. Um, in, um, in, in, in fact, we've noticed that last, last time we were dealing with this Masonic magazine called The New Age. The whole thing of Freemasonry is about a coming new order. Quantum Spirituality by Leonard Sweet, Rick Warren's buddy. Oh yeah, me and Lenny. Oh yeah, we're going to change the paradigm of everything. The whole quantum spirituality, postmodern apologetic, is that he is foreseeing a new order of religion coming on the earth. The Book of Mormon talks about it. All, I mean, all of this stuff is, is all about that. And it's no wonder that they're saying all this because, let me show you something, let me show you the truth here. Let me open my Bible to Hebrews 9, 10. This is the truth. This is the King James Bible. Here is what, here's what churches for 400 years were building themselves upon. This doctrine and this idea, Hebrews 9, 10. He's talking, about, um, the, he's talking about the sacrifices of the Old Testament. says, which was a figure for the time then present. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10 which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse watchings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Here, the, the, I believe it's the Apostle Paul teaching that all of the sacrifices in the Old Covenant under the Law and the Old Testament could not make the person perfect. It could not bring those to perfection. It could not bring the kingdom of God into their lives. It couldn't save them. Why? Because it was carnal. It was cardinal, carnal ordinances. But it was imposed on them until a time when God was going to reform everything. Literally. We use the word reform like, ah, we need a change or whatever. But God takes the old man, the old sinner like me, and he makes a new creation out of the old. That's what he does. He is re he's going to reform me to be in his perfect image one of these days, from flesh to spirit. And so there was a time of reformation, which is Christ coming, fulfilling all of the Old Testament law, fulfilling the sacrifices, fulfilling the blood atonements, fulfilling all of those things. And now, instead of a religion that says, do and live, now we have a new way, a religion that says, believe and live. That's what the King James says. NIV, Hebrews 9.10. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations implying until the time of the what? The new order. Henry Kissinger must read the NIV and George Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev and everybody else. But that's, so we have a, we have a new age coming where now the new Bibles, the false Bibles, are talking about a new order that's coming just around the river bend. You even have um, religious movements, especially in America, Christian movements. You ever heard of Joel's Army? We've talked about that. We have a video uh, called The Truth Behind Joel's Army. Todd Bentley and all of those crowd, the New Apostolic Reformation, IHOP, International House of Pancakes. No, prayer, International House of Prayer. Uh, and the dangerous doctrines 
that they are espousing and that they are promoting out there. They're actually talking about a new order that's coming. In fact, one of the, one of the groups that sort of gave rise to the current Joel's Army crowd was called the New Order of the Latter Reign. It's a movement in the 40s which gave birth to the New Apostolic Reformation, Joel's Army Heresy. Here's one of their books, Joel's Army, The New Breed. Get it? The New Breed. It's a new generation. It's a new genetic structure. So now I want you to think about genes being spliced and stuff added to it. See, the old order is the old way of thinking in our old brain. So the new order says we got to change even how people think. Well, how do you do that? Give them new genes. Give them genes, genetics, that will change how they see the world. Um, the Mormon Church. Here's a magazine for the youth of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints called The New Era. And so we're seeing it. We're seeing new paradigms, new, uh, a shift. Um, Brian McLaren and these others will put on what's called the Shift Conference. And what that means? That means what that means. What does that mean? That means that they're, they, they are promoting a time when every religious idea on the earth right now is going in the toilet and everybody is going to have a new way of worshiping, a new God that they're going to worship. And we know, according to the scriptures, that there is no new thing under the sun what they're going to do, and, this, and they do, they call it ancient future. They say, we're going to dig up the past and bring it to the future. What does that mean? We'll show you. We've talked about it before. Basically, here comes the beast who was and is not and yet shall be. That's what that's referring to. But this new order, in fact, let's go to, uh, there's a website. Uh, um, it's about the, it's called thegreatseal.com, and it gives you all these little interesting facts about the great seal about the number 13s that are on there and all the symbolisms of the eagle and where they got it from and how it progressed. And this is where I got some of the information. But do you know where Anuit Coeptus Novus Ordo Seclorum actually came from? Came from two poems that a guy named Virgil wrote. What am I going to show you? wrote them in Latin. They've been translated into English in various ways. There's discrepancies about how they're translated. But I'm going to show you the gist. In other words, we're going to do like we do in the Bible. If we see a verse, Paul says, walk circumspectly. That means look around that verse. See what neighborhood it's in. See what, it, see what it's referring to. All right? Go backward and go forward and just read the whole context of that verse so you really understand it. What we're going to do is we're going to look at those two phrases. I don't equip this and Novus Ordo Seclorum, especially Novus Ordo Seclorum, to find out where it came from and what it was talking about because I think what it was talking about is why it was chosen. So this is from uh, thegreatseal.com. Here is where Novus Ordo Seclorum came from. Um, Come are those last days that the Sibyl sang, the age's mighty march begins anew. Now come the virgin, Saturn reigns again. Now from high heaven descends a wondrous race. Look at that. Thou on the newborn babe who first shall end that age of iron bid a golden dawn. Thou trampling out what prince our crimes have left shalt free the nations from perpetual fear. While he to bliss shall waken with the blessed, see the brave mingling and be seen of them, ruling that world o'er which his father's arm shed peace. So, and it says here, that key phrase bolded above has been translated as, a great series or mighty order of ages is born anew. Charles Thompson was a former Latin teacher and Virgil was, his one, was one of his favorite poets. Inspired by the above passage, he coined the motto, Novus Ordo Seclorum, and placed it beneath the unfinished pyramid where he explained it signifies the beginning of the new American era which commences from the Declaration of Independence in uh, 1776. So, look at this again. He talks about uh, the age is mighty, March begins anew, and then underneath that, now come the virgin, Saturn reigns 
again. Who is Saturn? Saturn, and you know what Saturn looks like. Saturn is that planet with rings around it. If you look in Ezekiel 1, we won't spend a lot of time there. If you look in Ezekiel 1, you'll see the four cherubs have wheels and rings around them. It's like a wheel surrounded by a ring. That's what Saturn looks like. You know who God called Lucifer? The anointed cherub. Think of who Saturn is. Saturn is is going to reign again. That's his new order. The birth of a new order. The ages mighty march begins anew. Or a great series or mighty order of ages is born anew. New world order or Novus Order Seclorum has the idea that that which was is that which shall be. He reigned in the past. There are five kings. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is and one is, uh, one is not. And the other one shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And it means that he was at one time, he is not now, but he's going to rise again. And it was interesting to me that in this particular translation, they talked about now from high heaven descends a wondrous race. You know, that is precisely what God told um, Israel, Deuteronomy 28 and Daniel, I think, chapter 9, where he talked about because, because they will not honor God and keep his word and keep his commandments, God was going to send them a nation from the heavens, a nation whose tongue they would not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. That's who that is. So at the bottom of this, Notice we have uh, Charles Taze Russell, Divine Plan for the Ages, shown in the Great Pyramid. That's what this is all about. An accurate translation of Novus Ordo Seclorum is a new order of the ages. Now, he gives another translation of this same passage, and I want you to take a look at it. This is why this phrase was chosen for our great seal, and this is what it means. Now the last age by Kume's Sibyl Sung has come and gone, and the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign. There it is again. With a, look at it, look at it. A new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou at the boy's birth in whom the iron shall cease, the golden age arise. Under thy guidance, whatso tracks remain of our old wickedness, once done away, shall free the earth from never ceasing fear. He shall receive the life of God's, think Genesis chapter 3, and see, watch this now, look at it, heroes with God's commingling. Stop right here. The Novus Ordo Seclorum. It's not only a time when Saturn, an old ancient king, is going to rise up again. He's going to be born again. He's going to have a new birth. Because when you come up out of the sea, that's like being born, right? Because a woman's water is seawater. We are, we, you and I are literally born out of, a, out of an ocean, out of a sea. So he's going to rise up from the sea again. He's coming back, not from heaven but from the depths of the earth. And that's what they only do thou at the boy's birth. You know who that is? That's Ichabod. Ichabod is, is a type that says the glory is departed. It's a type when this new order comes on the earth and God says, I'm out of here. My glory has departed and I'm going to let you have it. Go study that again. Because there was something taken out of the way in that story. And there's someone who had a falling away and the man of sin was, you go study that. First Samuel chapter 4, I think is what it is. But notice this. They talk about a new breed, Joel's army, new genetics, new strain. Uh, and then it says, heroes with gods commingling. Do you remember this? We've talked about this before. Man, he looks wicked, doesn't he? I mean, there's nothing, every time I look at this pope, I'm just going, yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks like the Dark Lord from Star Wars or something like that. What is that cowboy hat he's wearing on his head? That red, red's color for sin. Red is the, red is the color for Mystery Babylon. He's got sin on his head. 
But that cowboy hat, you know what it's called? The Saturno. Why? Because it looks like Saturn. And the symbolism of something on someone's head has to do with dominion, has to do with authority. When uh, Paul talked to Timothy about neglect not the gift that is in thee by the laying on the hands of the presbytery, when you lay hands on someone, you're putting ten on there, you're putting authority, and what happened was Timothy was called to be a bishop, and the presbytery, the elders, these are just ordinary men, but who were the elders, the wise men of the church, who were conferring authority on him, saying, you can be our bishop, you can be our pastor, you can watch for our souls. And as long as you preach that book, we'll follow your faith. That's what they were doing. So something on somebody's head means that rules over them. Death reigns over us. Christ's crown of thorns on his head was Christ removing death reigning over us. So here's Il Papa with Saturn on his head, the crown of Saturn. He is showing, I don't believe the Pope is the Antichrist. I believe he is an Antichrist. And I think that everything about the Vatican and everything about their religion and their symbols and their doings and here, eat this. This is God. And if you eat God, you'll be God. That's what transubstantiation is. But everything they're doing is a precursor of the new religion where literally the boy that's born anew is going to reign once again like he did back in the old days. But then it talks about heroes mingling with gods. Where do we go? Genesis chapter 6. Giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. That's your new breed right there. The same became mighty men which are of old, men of renown. Jeremiah 50, 37. A sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her, and they shall become as women. A sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. The mingling is going to take place. The iron mingled, that's the language of the King James Bible, iron mingled with miry clay. There's your mingling right there. And that's what the new order of the ages is all about. That's why it was picked to be put on the seal of the United States of America with that pyramid and capstone. It's all going to come into play one of these days. That new order is coming around. Notice what Jude said about it. He said, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, remember Sodom, Genesis 13, 13 with 13 words, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fires. So Jude is equating here what the angels did with humans to what the sodomites want to do with the angels. Going after strange flesh, different than what your own kind is. That's what he's referring to, and, that, and he's putting them together. And these are set forth for an example. Why? Because we're going to see it again. We're going to see a day when the iron is going to mix with miry clay. And when this new baby is born, he's going to bring in, instead of the old iron age, a new age and a new order upon planet Earth. 1 Corinthians 6.15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And there you see the harlots, the goddesses, the thirteen Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Here you see the 13 harlots, 13 stars, 13 letters, e pluribus unum, all talking about let's all join the same body. Let me, let me kind of give you something to think about. I think, I think it's all going to come down to this. We know 
that you and I who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe the scriptures, we are saved by grace through faith and so on, that we are called the body of Christ. And I believe that God in the last days is going to gather together in one body, all of them that are his, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's going to be Jesus. And we're all in him as his body. One man here. But then think about another gathering. Gathering together everybody in the world. E pluribus unum, out of many. One. Gathering all the world's religions, all of the world's politics, all of the world's finances, everything, all joined together in a fraternal brotherhood where everybody is all one man. Think of all the places in the Bible where they talked about they gathered themselves together as one man. Think about that. And then you have a picture, 1 Samuel 17. You have the Philistines who have encroached in the land of Judah. And then you have all the Israelites and all their armies. But when the war starts and the battle's fought, it all comes down to two guys. Goliath, who is the mingled guy, represents the iron kingdom. He represents the iron mixed with miry clay. He represents, all, he represents the e pluribus unum, novus ordo seclorum. That's what he represents. He represents the new order in which everybody is dissolved into this one beast man. Okay? And then you have David. He is a type of Christ. He's the shepherd. He has killed the lion and the bear. He's, he's saved his father's lamb is what he did. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is one man fighting one man. Okay? Christ, Antichrist. Even the Lord, he comes with ten thousands of his saints, and we are with him as we are one body and one man. And here's the Antichrist and all that together. So you kind of see where we're going with this. This new order has everything to do with the beast gathering everybody into the body of a harlot and being one with that harlot system, that harlot religion, those harlot um, politicals, that harlot kingdom, harlot finances, because why do harlots do what they do? The love of money. So let's look at the judgment now that takes place. Revelation 17, 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and, and, I talk, and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. We're looking at E pluribus unum and there's a judgment for those who have joined into the body of the harlot. Revelation 17, 15, he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Remember what, um, remember what Genesis says about the gathering together of the waters he called seas. So we have the waters gathering together, we have the whore sitting upon them, and we have the waters representing peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues for, and where does the beast, this is the sea, this is the gathering of the waters, where does the beast rise up out of? The four. He comes up out of like the four elements and the four base pairs of your DNA. The four peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. He rises up out of all of that as the quintessence, the fifth element. That's what that pentagram that we saw earlier represents. You know, the guy you know, with the head and the, the four appendant. In fact, let's go back and look at it. And he's there. It's, it's called the New Order. And that's what that symbol represents. It's the beast rising up out of those waters where the whore sitteth, because the whore has gathered everybody to be part of her body. They have joined themselves with the whore. Here is the whore's book. Okay? The the New Age Aquarian Conspiracy. Here is a New Ager, Leonard Sweet, writing about and, and equating it with Christianity, quantum spirituality, 
cosmic, the cosmic Christ they talk about. So then Rick Warren jumps in bed with the new age. He has joined himself with the harlot. Now he's part of her and her system. And everybody that chooses, chooses to follow after this crowd and the new paradigm that they're bringing and the new age Bibles and the new order talked about in them and so on. Everybody that jumps into that becomes one with the harlot. And when she is gathered, everybody together like the 13 pieces of Osiris' body, she'll be ready for that child who's going to bring in the new order to be born. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore are the nations mad. And so God is using Babylon. He's using Babylon as like a, she's like the ultimate chick magnet. Everybody is drawn to her because of her beauty. Everybody is drawn to her because of her doctrine. Everybody is drawn to her because it's like um, uh, the, the last weekend we were seeing images, the, the sanitized images that they put on the news of the gay pride parade in St. Louis. And now everybody from all nations, all colors, all languages, all preferences, they're all coming together as one now, aren't they? You know who they're excluding? Us. And gladly so. I don't want to be part of what they're going to be a part of. That's Babylon. And God is using Babylon to draw everybody into this one body. So he can destroy her. And that's precisely what he's going to do. In the 13th book of the New Testament, we find a picture of that. 1 Thessalonians 5, that's the 13th book of the New Testament. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as what? A child being born, as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So here Babylon is a golden cup, in the Lord's hand, and he's using it to make all the nations of the world drunk. But here we have the contrast. We have a time coming, 13th book of the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians. He's talking about an age coming when they're going to say peace and safety, a new age of peace and safety. It's what the new age is all about. And they're going to say peace and safety, sudden destructions come up, going to come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. We're going to go to Isaiah 13 and see exactly uh, a parallel to this. But remember the child being born as being part of the new order of the ages. Literally, the beast rising up out of the sea and ruling over mankind. And the contrast that we see in the 13th book of the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians, is, by the way, what is in the previous chapter 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, what's in there? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <laughs> could have figured that out. You know what's there? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive shall, and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's the gathering of his people. Then we have the gathering of, of Mystery Babylon. And we are children of the day, and we're sober. That means we don't get drunk in the spirit. We don't chase down spiritual practices in our churches 
that bring about altered states of consciousness. We don't say, oh, I'm getting drunk in the spirit of God. We don't do that. We don't get ourselves slain in the spirit. If you have, come, you know what? Come out of that. Leave Babylon. Walk away from here. That's the, that's what the division that you see. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5. You see 1 Thessalonians 4, God gathering his people in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, a new order is coming. And they that sleep, and they that be drunken, it's going to come as a thief in the night and they will not escape. We will. Because we're not appointed under wrath. Isaiah 13, 1, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. It's the number 13, 13 stars, e pluribus unum. Look in verse 6, it's the burden of Babylon, how ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty, therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. That's because they lit their divine spark. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath. That's what Paul was talking about, 1 Thessalonians 5. And fierce anger to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations. Look ye there. That is the 13-starred constellation, e pluribus unum, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Are you kidding me? This Bible has the answer to every mystery that the New World Order is trying to keep from you. God is showing you. See, see those stars, that cluster of 13, see that constellation? Oh, that's the brightness and the glory of America. God said, I'm going to shut her down and make her dark. You think about where America is spiritually right now. We can't even, we cannot even stop the sodomites from taking control of every state in the Union and getting those states to bow before them by approving sodomite marriage. There is almost no light left in America. This Bible's right. The constellation of those 13 stars is going dark. Children of the darkness. And everybody's going to be in pangs. Just like they were a woman. Isis. The harlot. Giving birth to a new son, a new order. Anu Aquaptus, he favors the undertaking, the birth of a new order. Now, Jeremiah 51, thus, verse 58, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire, and the people shall labor in vain, and the folk in the fire, and they shall be weary. Jeremiah, if you, if you study Jeremiah 50 and 51, you're going to see God's judgment of Babylon. God's going to give you some wisdom concerning that. And we know uh, Jeremiah 50 says it. We know, um, or 51. We know Revelation 17, Revelation 18 talks about it. Babylon is fallen. Think of things that fall. Think of slaying in the spirit, falling backwards. Think of Eli who fell backwards when he realized that the ark, the mercy seat of God, his throne, his dominion, was taken out of the way. And what happened? When he fell, Ichabod was born. What is it about Babylon that falls? He said, it was the walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire. So we have a prototype of that. We have a picture of the coming destruction of mystery Babylon the Great. He said Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Twice. Christ destroyed its power, her power, at his first coming. He comes to do away with it completely at his second coming. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. How many times did Dagon fall before the Ark of the Covenant? Twice. First time he fell, his priest had to go set him up because he couldn't rise up himself. 
They set him back up. Well, you destroyed our religion. We're going to build it back, though. You destroyed our Tower of Babel. We're going to build it back. And that's what they're doing. They're rebuilding it right now. You know what's going to happen? Christ comes again. It's going to fall again. You cannot, listen, you cannot stand. If you're wicked, you cannot stand in the presence of God. That's why we are in Christ. Amen? So we have a picture. We have a picture with the numbers and everything prophetic. We have a picture of that in the scriptures. It's Jericho. What Did Jericho fall? Yeah, what fell with Jericho? Let's read it. Joshua chapter 6, verse 12. Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord, the seven priests bearing seven trumpets. Let's see, is that something in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, about seven trumpets? Absolutely. Bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, but the rearward, or re-reward, which means it was in the back, it was in the rear word, came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets. And Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Are you kidding me? The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. And here we have the priest blowing the seven trumpets, and they're shouting. And what happens when we are caught up to be with the Lord? Babylon is fallen is fallen. Whew, boy, thank you. And I, I like this story because it dawned on me, and I always play with people. I, you know, how many times did they march around Jericho? And everybody says, seven times. And I go, no. One time a day for six days. That's six times. And seven times on the seventh day. They marched around her 13 times. Why? It's a prophecy of mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's who Jericho is. And so Jericho was destroyed. Woe be to any man who tries to rebuild it. Look at it, Joshua 6, 17. The city shall be accursed. That is the, let me stop right here. That's the opposite of being a blessed. It is. You cannot be cursed and blessed. You cannot, some, don't let anybody tell you, I know you're saved, but you've got a curse on you. You've got a generational curse because what your grandpa did back in the Civil War. And, uh, don't believe it. If you're really saved, you're blessed and you cannot be cursed. That was pointed out in the days of Balaam. You cannot curse what God says is blessed. So Babylon and Jericho are not the blessed city, heavenly Jerusalem. They're the cursed city. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. What is that accursed thing? I think it probably has something to do with the Antichrist. And you remember the story of Achan, how he went in and took the Babylonian garment, which means he clothed himself like Babylon. He joined himself with the harlots, what he did, and stole a bunch of stuff. And he, what did he do? He hid it. He buried it down in the depths of the earth and hid it. That's a picture, people. And what they do to Achan? They killed him, his wife, his children, burn his house, burn everything he had. You know why? He joined himself with the accursed city, Babylon. And God tells us, come out from among her. I love America. I'm a patriot. I believe, I, I wish that, I wish that we could sound an alarm, blow a trumpet, 
and bring this nation back to the to the time when the Bible was respected. I would love for that to happen. I don't think it's going to. So while I love my country, and I have found myself literally stressed in my heart, because I look around this beautiful state of Missouri, and I see, I mean, it is at the, Missouri is beautiful. Springtime, summertime, fall. I love it. To think that if God's word is true, and it is, that the Sodomites are going to keep going until this entire nation is in ashes. That bothers me. Because, number one, I love where I live. But number two, I think I know what rises out of those ashes. And I think you know what I'm talking about. So anyway... Um, that city is accursed. In Joshua 6.20, So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. God destroyed everything. And the wall of the city fell flat. Babylon is fallen, Revelation 18.2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The eagle was an unclean bird. And Babylon becomes the cage and the hold of the eagle. It's all there in the symbolism, and the Bible is the only place that you can find the truth of what that means. So, what do we do? Again, I love my country. I love my countrymen. When I travel to a, another country, I'm ready to come back to America. Americans, I understand. I don't understand people from other worlds, but I understand Americans. I may not like many of them, but I understand them. But I'll tell you that I'm not going down with her. I won't. If the whole country says, we're going to go the Sodom way, I'm not going that way. If it costs me my life, my estate, everything that I have, I talk like I've got a big mansion over here. My, my double wide, if it costs me everything, I'm not going to lose my soul for my country. Jeremiah 51, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. He says it again in Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. At some point, I'm speaking to my people in America. At some point, you're going to have to let go of America the Beautiful, America the Great. You're going to have to let go of that flag. And I still respect the flag. I don't go for that burning and stuff like that. I No. I'm still an old school American. There's nothing wrong with that. But as America slides down the pit and becomes more and more of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, God calls his people out. Well, where are we going to move to? Belize, I, one guy said, oh, we got to move to Belize, and he took everybody to Belize. Jim Jones took everybody to Diana. That's not what I'm talking about. 
at some point God is going to bring, physically carry and bring his people to wherever he wants to put them. Maybe that's the translation. But at some point, you're going to have to be Lot and let go of Babylon, Sodom. And not be Lot's wife who initially all said, Amen! Amen, angels! That's good! Oh yeah, that's good preaching! And the minute you cross the gate, you turn around and start looking back and going, I'm going to miss Babylon. Don't be that way. At some point, we're going to have to come out. We're going to have to come out of the political schemes of this country. We're going to have to come out of the denominations. We're going to have to come out of the the spiritual movements that are going on because you know that Babylon is pulling everybody into her bed to be one with her harlotry. God is calling his people who believe this Bible and who know it who have a simple faith Jesus saves. God's calling you out. Stay out. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.